Taylor out to the middle or something. There we go. I'm so sorry, especially to you online. I know that makes it hard for you. I apologize. Anna had COVID vis visit her. It came and it descended and it visited you and we weren't able to be here on grad Sunday, but you are so special to us. And we want to make sure that you get this moment of absorbing all the love of this congregation that has raised you and watched you grow into such a beautiful young woman. Um, hand me a microphone, please. We're going to let her talk. <laughs> Did you make a face? <laughs> you got to sing and talk. You got to <laughs> sing and talk. <laughs> it's what happens when you grow up. You got to do it all. We just, I just want you to share with them. You know, where you're headed, what you're doing, okay. all that you've accomplished. Okay. I'm headed to Kent State in the fall, and I'm planning on majoring in psychology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have graduated? I graduated from Zane State and Tri-Valley. Yep. Good for you. Let's get... <laughs> you could handle that, couldn't you? No, you're not going anywhere. I'm still holding your Bible. Okay. Okay. <laughs> We give you this Bible in celebration of who you are, but also so that you know that the Word of God is always with you and this congregation's love is always right here with you. Let us pray for Anna. Oh, Lord God, we give thanks for this beautiful daughter of yours that you planted in our midst. We ask that as she enters this next phase of life that you continue to shine your light down her path and wrap her up in your Holy Spirit. We pray this with all our love for her, and in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You're welcome. <laughs> now, let us begin our worship with our prelude.
morning, everyone. Well, thank you so much for being here on this Memorial Day weekend where we honor the service of all the men and women who have served in our, our military this weekend. Could you please uh, stand for the call to worship? With open hands, the Church of Jesus Christ is ready to gather us in, to lift our spirits and lighten our grief, to double our joy and to deepen our awe. Open hands, open arms, come in, welcome home. The opening song is number 91, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Great healer, send your amazing spirit into this place. Touch and heal our brokenness and lift us out of pain and despair. Dry the tears of our hurts, comfort and nourish us with the many blessings of your powerful love. Lord God, may we flourish and blossom in the warmth of this community of faith. In Christ Jesus we pray, Amen. In the name of Jesus, we pray the words he taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Prayer response is number 44, open our eyes, Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> Our first scripture comes from the book of Acts. This book was written as a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. I'm reading chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is Jesus' last time with the disciples. Hear the word of God. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of life. Thank you. I'd like to invite all our children to come forward now for our children's moment. Good morning. All right, do you all like to play tag? What version of tag do you like to play? What version of tag do you like? There's freeze, there's Chinese tag, there's Bible tag we've been playing in pastor's class. There's Nerf ball tag, there's traditional tag. So what version do you guys like to play? Bible tag, they like Bible tag. Pastor's class, we've been playing Bible tag. It's really fun. What version? Do you like freeze tag or regular tag? Freeze tag. Freeze tag was my favorite growing up. My brothers liked um, Chinese tag. Have you ever played? When you get tagged, you have to grab your ankles and play (laughs) Until until someone who's not it tags you. And that's the thing with tag, other than Bible tag, we don't have an it in Bible tag. But most games of tag, there's an it, right? It goes, you're it, you're it, you're it. Well, in our scripture that Elena just read for us, Jesus tags the disciples. Up until this point, Jesus was walking the earth with them, doing ministry, and then he was crucified and he died. And he came back to life, and he walked with them for another 40 days, teaching them. But in this moment in the text, he rises up into heaven. But before he does so, he goes, tag, 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 you're it. And he tells the disciples, it's now yours. You're to go out into the world and do ministry in my name. And guess what? As believers, as you make a decision in your life to be a follower of Jesus, you are saying, I'm now it. So that is what we're doing here is we're learning, we're growing as a church so we can go out in the world and do the ministry that Jesus has said here, it's yours. So that's what you're doing, learning and growing to decide, is that something I'm going to do with my life? And we hope so, because it brings a lot of joy and a lot of love, not only into your own life, but into our world. Let us pray. Holy God, 
Thank you for these children who sit before you this morning. They bring such hope into our midst and into your world. We ask that you pour your spirit over them and over all your children, especially the children who are hurting, who are lost. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right, those of you going to Children Worship Wonder, you can follow Elena and Kim. Those of you who are staying in worship, there are creative worship bags hanging up over there. Today is known as Ascension Sunday. It is the Sunday that we remember and celebrate Jesus' going up into heaven to be with God for forevermore. And as I just shared with the children, it is also the Sunday that we remember that Jesus says, Tag, you're it. It is the Sunday when the ministry was handed over to the disciples and to all of us who would follow. As we come to this time of sharing, we come and we remember that it is our responsibility to give back. God blesses our lives with so much. We are so rich with all that we have and all that we've been given. And we've been asked to give just a portion of that back. And so I invite you to do so. You can give in the offering plates in the narthex. You can give online. But however you give, do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father, we come here today showered with blessings from you. Today, we bring a portion of that back to this church family. We ask that you bless all the givers and that you bless the gifts we bring today so that we as a congregation family may be able to spread your love, hope, peace, and joy into this world that is very broken and grieving. In God's name we pray, amen.
She can talk and sing beautifully. <laughs> Thank you, Anna and the Praise Band. If you want more of that, come this Friday at 6.30. The news of the week has rattled me. I don't know about all of you, but there's like a lump of grief in me that I am struggling with. And on this Memorial Weekend, when we remember those who laid down their lives so we could have freedoms in this country, I sit with this grief of lives lost. And I don't know what to do with it. Our general minister and president, the Reverend Terry Horde Owens, put out a message on Wednesday to the entire Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And after watching it, I thought it was too important to not share in worship. So we are going to take a few moments and we are going to hear from our general minister and president. Please watch this message. Hello, disciples. On May 14th, when I was driving to Iowa to install the new regional minister of the Upper Midwest region, I heard on my radio in my car about the shooting in Buffalo. It began to dawn on me the more details I heard that the shooting, the massacre, had occurred in a black neighborhood, in a grocery store that represented the sole grocery store in that neighborhood, an area that had been and still is really a food desert. Once again, assault weapons. Once again, hatred. Once again, some distorted understanding that uh, there is a replacement theory that black and brown people are here to replace white people. Such evil, such trauma visited once again upon black communities. And then yesterday, Tuesday, May 25th in Uvalde, Texas, at present count 19 elementary school children, once again, assault weapons, we don't know the motivation. We do know that the shooter went to his grandmother's home to shoot her. We know that DNA matches are necessary to identify these children because their bodies have been eviscerated. Assault weapons are not hunting rifles. Assault weapons are weapons of war that have no place on the streets of any society. Hatred has no place in our world. Racism has no place in our world. We are Christians. Yes, we are followers of Jesus Christ and we will pray. But right now, church, I need you to pray and then rise from your knees, seeking what God would have you to do. What elected official, be it city council person, alderman, dog catcher, sheriff, mayor, state legislator, governor, secretary of state, attorney general, U.S. congressman, congressperson, U.S. senator, who are you talking to? Who are you organizing and mobilizing? to ensure that at every level of society, we are ready to say that assault weapons, which eviscerate bodies, have no place in our society. This is not life, this is not love. This is evil to use such weapons of destruction. Wherever you have the opportunity to advocate for the right, to advocate for truth, I pray that you will do it. This is what imagination is about. 
considering what the alternative to this unjust society looks like. And I would say that the alternative to what we're experiencing and what we've experienced over the past couple of weeks looks like a world without assault weapons. It looks like a world where our schools are teaching the truth of the history of the United States and the history of racism, where we acknowledge the systemic injustice of, anti of racism and we work intentionally to dismantle those systems. That's what the new world I hope we are called to live into will look like, where all are loved, all can flourish, all have grocery stores in their neighborhoods where you can drop your children off at school and not worry whether or not they'll be killed in the middle of their school day, where you can earn enough to pay your own rent, buy your own home, to have the best education possible, to be safe on the streets of your city or town, to know that when you walk outside, your life is not at risk just because of who you are. There is an alternate option. I pray that we will find the courage to not only imagine it, but to work each and every day for it. God bless you. Remember that God loves you, and it is that assurance with which we must move forward to imagine and create that new world where the limitless love of God is full and flourishing for us all. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Pray with me. Oh, holy and almighty God, our hearts are heavy. Our world is broken. Your joy is elusive at times. Your love is hard to touch at others. We give thanks that your son Jesus came and walked this earth and showed us how to walk in difficult days. Help us cling to his example. Help us embody all that he is. Give us courage to step into the pain. Give us courage to walk into the darkness and be your light. Oh, Lord God. We ask that you be with those who are suffering. Be with those that are sitting here today who are trembling in fear. Be with those who have given their lives time and time again. And we give thanks for those who have given their life the ultimate sacrifice of death so that we can worship here and stand here in freedom. Empower us, Lord, to use those freedoms to bring about your creation here on earth. Oh God, we give thanks for your eternal love for a love that breaks through the violence. Embrace those whose lives this week have been shattered. Embrace them and put people in their lives that will love as you have commanded us to love. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I am so grateful that we have this table to come to today. This table that welcomes everyone, 
regardless of what is happening in life. You're welcome here. No matter where you've come from, welcomed here. Let us come. Let us prepare ourselves to receive this great gift once again by singing together, become to us the living bread. A blessing it is to gather here with you. None of us has to do this alone. We don't have to do any of this alone. What a joy it is to celebrate here at Christ's table our unity, to celebrate that gift Jesus gave us of everlasting life, of everlasting hope, of everlasting joy. This is the news we need to hear today. Jesus knew that we would need to return to this table time and time again. And so on that night when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took a cup. And he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for each of you. Take and drink in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear God, we gather around this table as brothers and sisters in Christ to remember the sacrifice you made through your son, Jesus. Forgive our sins and guide us to be more like your son. Teach us to love and not hate. Guide us to serve others. Remind us to seek justice. Cultivate in us humble and loving hearts. In your son's name, amen. Amen. As children of God, as one in Christ, let us eat of the bread of life. And as children, let us drink of the cup of salvation. Amen. my spirit's doing, so I'm going to ask you, how's your spirit today? Heavy? 
worried, concerned. It was just a few weeks ago I stood here and I asked that very same question, how is your spirit? And I followed it up with, has the world pulled your attention away from the joy that we celebrated on Easter Sunday just a few weeks ago? That's trying to do it, isn't it, folks? It's really trying hard. But I want to stand here today and once again say, even though the world is trying, we are still the embodiment of the hope and the joy of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to be as Christians. Last week, Reverend Harris reminded us that as the church, as individuals that make up the church, we are Christ's body here and now. And we are the ones that bring hope into the world. We hear this in the text that Elena read for us earlier when Jesus promises the Holy Spirit will come and the disciples will share the hope, share the love with all in the world. On this Ascension Sunday, the disciples watch as Jesus scoots on up into heaven and disappears from their view. For Jesus' disciples, the ascension was a powerful catalyst. It was a moment that was sending them on the mission that Jesus had prepared them for, that he'd left them to do. The days following Jesus' crucifixion had been filled with moments of grief, then moments filled with incredible awe and wonder. And now Jesus is lifted up into the heavens before them, entrusting his mission and his ministry to them. Jesus' ascension sent the disciples into the mission field out to teach and share the good news. The resurrection had changed everything, and now the ascension, the instructions he gives them at the ascension gives them focus and a way forward. Jesus describes this mission in verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in all of Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was echoing prophets before him. The prophets continued to say this message that God's love, God's message was for the whole world. But Israel tended to forget that and become a bit narrow-minded. They forgot that Abram's blessing was to go to all people. They forgot that the temple was for all nations. And they were passionate about being God's people in God's land. But they forgot and neglected God's mission and justice for all people. The Gospel of Matthew emphasizes this point in chapter 28, and this is Matthew's telling of Jesus' ascension. And I'm going to read for you verses 19 and 20, his instructions to the disciples prior to his ascent. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Then Jesus ascends. He leaves and there they stand in the front row once again for God's miraculous mysteries being played out right before them. They're amazed. They're stunned. They're standing there staring up at the sky. I mean, wouldn't you? Our text in Acts points out that while they're standing there looking up at the sky, angels appear and they get their gaze to come back down to earth, saying, He'll come back from the skies just like He left. Now stop staring. There's work to be done. The work to be done was given to the disciples. It wasn't given to the religious leaders of the day or the politicians of the day. It was given to ordinary workaday people who had followed and learned from Jesus. They were not much different than you and me. They grew up in families, cleaning fish, learning about collecting taxes, 
they were not raised in generations of religious leaders or politicians. They had their flaws. They misunderstood parables. They fought over who was the greatest. They fell asleep in the garden. They denied Jesus in his last days. They returned to their place of comfort in a fishing boat when they didn't know what else to do. But something in this moment at the ascension happens. Jesus' words open a revelation to the disciples and hopefully to us as well. The teachings and actions of Christ following his resurrection leading up to the ascension to heaven were powerful ones. So we can look at this ascension as like a hinge that was holding together the resurrection and Pentecost. It is here at the ascension that the disciples are truly begin to understand that Jesus' mission was now theirs. Far from feeling abandoned, they felt empowered. His mission was now their mission. They were now just waiting for that Holy Spirit. They continued to praise God in the temple, waiting for Pentecost. They went aside and continued to pray fervently as they waited. We'll hear more about that next week. Jesus doesn't abandon his disciples. His last earthly words were words of reassurance and empowerment. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then for the first time, the disciples take ownership of this mission. They acknowledge that they were partners with Jesus. Today, Ascension Sunday, is a time for us to reflect on how we partner with Jesus in our lives and in our faith. Do we have a clear sense of a personal mission? Do we feel empowered? Do we see the gospel as something more than just church work? Or do we see it as life-giving, soul-nourishing passion that we need to share with the world? Jesus' ascension has four implications for our lives. First, as Christians, it is our responsibility. The disciples could have come up with plenty of excuses to avoid the mission. First and foremost, I'm not Jesus. We're not Jesus. Then there's always, we don't want to be crucified. We, too, can come up with lots of excuses I haven't been a Christian long enough. I'm not trained or have been to seminary. Someone might ask me a question I don't have the answer to. I'm too old to do any good anymore. Or I'm too young to do any good. I, haven't a, I don't have enough time in my schedule. My job is demanding, demands in my family. The demands, the demands, the demands, you fill in the blank. Jesus makes it clear in both the Gospel of Matthew and in the book of Acts that God's plan is for the ordinary, imperfect people like the disciples, like us, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. Second implication, we are not alone in this. The disciples were told they would have help, they would have an advocate, they would have the Holy Spirit they were to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to come, which it did on Pentecost in the upper room. As people living after Pentecost, we are Christians that have been given the same spirit as described in Acts chapter 2. That means our limitations, like theirs, need not stand in the way. The Holy Spirit will empower us, will embolden us, and fuse us together. Remember, we are one in Christ. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It weaves us together in mysterious and miraculous ways. We receive this through our faith. We are not alone. We have God, we have Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have one another. I mean, that's good news. We have one another. We're not alone in this.
this. So that leads to the third thing. We are partners with Christ through the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't go preaching persuasive words with a demonstration, without the demonstration of the Spirit. Remember, he was a Pharisee trained, and the Pharisees were crushing those Christians down, figuratively and literally. And Paul changes, and the words that come out of his mouth are ones that embolden Christianity and share that mission. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul states, My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. In other words, it is through our weaknesses, it is through our imperfections that the Holy Spirit shines through. I am often amazed at what God does with this lump of clay. If you knew me back and when, you'd be going, yeah, we're amazed too. <laughs> that I'm standing here bringing a sermon on a Sunday morning. My 17-year-old self is in horror that that is happening. <laughs> but that's what the Holy Spirit can do. All that we do is in partnership with Christ that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Our mission is people. Our mission is the church. Our mission as the manifestation of Christ here and now is only possible when we claim the partnership that we have in Christ, which empowers us with the Holy Spirit. We're not alone. Trust that. And the more you trust, the more it will come. As we look into our world of horrific pain, as we look out into people's lives that have been shredded apart by the world, we can partner with them and show them the love of God and Jesus Christ. So when we go out into that world, we can go with this knowledge that we'll be equipped, that we'll be empowered. And it'll come right through all those places where we feel we don't have the ability. And the final and fourth implication is the time is now. The angels issued a clear message. Jesus is coming back the same way he left. And after nearly 2,000 years, it's easy not to take that seriously. And if we're truly honest, most of us would believe that Christ's return will not happen in our lifetimes. In the book of James, we're reminded, though, that our lives are like mist. We only have this little moment. So the time is now. Hear these words in chapter 4. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there, doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We have this moment. The time is now. And we are called to do as Jesus commanded, which is love God and love neighbor as ourselves. Our lives are like mist. They're a moment. They're a speck of dust. We're not to wait. We're to act now. Because the others we're sharing this world with, their lives are missed too. And they need us in this moment now. So we're to set aside our fears, set aside our excuses, and act now. Do now. Jesus is coming Jesus is coming. We hear this in Revelation chapter 22. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. 
The spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift, the one who testifies to these things, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is